Behold, the bridegroom coming. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. It wasn't just words that Jesus said, but it was everything he did that let us know that the smallest and the weakest of us are loved, that we matter to the one who made us, that he longs through all that he did for us to give hope. This, was what the, this is what Paul was sharing. And of course, he, I, he probably told the story of, of, how, of the woman who was taken in adultery. We've heard so many times, and there she was. The religious people were just so, you know, looking for, looking for somebody to condemn, looking for a way to condemn and reject him and say, I knew there was nothing to you. you. You didn't have the right answer here. And God gave him wisdom and grace that put them to shame and caused them to leave. And, and the shame went with them, and he lifted the shame from that poor woman. And when she left there, she was clean. She was full of the love of God and of hope. Over and over and over and over and over again, Paul could tell the stories. Because this was stuff that had just happened. This was only like, you know, a couple decades or so before. This was real recent history. You know, he could say, look, you know, we've got a friend we're traveling with us. He's, he, you know, he knows about all this stuff. He was in, I've met people who were there. I've met people who actually walked with him, and they were eyewitnesses of all of these things. They saw him walk on water. They saw him raise the dead. They saw his power against demon spirits. They saw all of these things in this man who came to, to show us, not just to tell us about God, but to show, show us by living among us. But then, in the eyes of people, the unthinkable happened, didn't it? In God's perfect plan, he was arrested, put through a mock trial, condemned to die, and put through some of the worst suffering that's ever been wreaked upon anybody. And I can imagine the jailer saying, what in the world is that about? What? I don't understand. This is the Son of God. How could, I mean, you know, surely he had power to stop that. If he could walk on water and command devils to leave, why in the world would he submit to such a thing? That doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, you can understand when you think, when you step back and think about it, Paul had a lot of explaining to do. He did summarize the message in its utter simplicity, but in order for that message to make any sense at all, he had to really tell who Jesus was, didn't he? And that's what he did. And then Paul was able to tell him why such an unthinkable thing had happened. That the entire human race, because of our sins, had been separated from a holy God. That the penalty for that sin was death. And that without something, we were in an utterly hopeless state, separated from God, unable to help ourselves. Well, he already felt in some sense, maybe he couldn't define it, but he already felt his need. He knew he was in the presence of something that he just caused him to be fearful, and uncertain, to realize he had a need. I pray there's somebody here that if, if you're in that place that you feel that need. God wants you to feel it, but he wants you to feel it so that you'll run to him and he can lift the burden from your heart. So anyway, Paul explained that all of the guilt, all of the sin, all of the shame, every evil thought, every evil deed, we sang the song this morning, was put upon him and charged to him. I tell you, how does that make you feel when you think of some of the things you've said and done? For him to be willing to do such a thing to be who he was and to be willing to stoop to that place where he took my guilt upon himself. Praise God. But he did it with willing heart. He did it with joy. And Paul, had, Paul explained all this to him, that he died 
as our substitute. He died as our representative, I think is a better word. If I had gone to that cross, that would have been the end of me. But he had no sin of, himself, of his own. He was like that spotless lamb that God had used as a type in the Old Testament. And sins had been symbolically placed upon that lamb, and the lamb was killed as a substitute for the people who had done the sinning. But here's Jesus, the lamb of the world, lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so Paul continues to explain, and I could, I could still imagine this jailer and his family living, it's almost like they're living through what's going on as he tells the story. I mean, you remember how the people who, were, who, who did live it felt? Confused? Just, I, I thought it was going to be this way, and look what's happened. I don't understand. Not only do I not understand, I see that evil is, is seemingly triumphing here, and we're in danger now. Oh, my God, what is going on? I don't understand. I don't get it. And you can just sense, if you think about it, this, the feeling of this fa man's family as they, as they were brought through something that they'd never heard. You know, we've heard all this. And sometimes it just becomes so, oh, yeah, I've heard that. But I pray that it will become real and new where it needs to yes. for all of our hearts. But this was a brand new thing to this fa man's family. And so they took him through right through to the Easter morning. Sunday morning, when the women went to the tomb and they were going to leave spices and they got there and the door was, I mean, the, they, were, they were, as they went, they said, now look, there's a big stone in front of the tomb. We didn't really think about that. What are we going to do? Who's going to help us roll that stone away? Obviously, it's bigger, bigger than two or three women could do. And so they got there and the stone was, was rolled away. And uh, the guards either weren't there or they were laying, whatever it was, it wasn't being guarded. And, you know, one of them, I think, went into the tomb. I don't know whether, I, I can't remember the exact details, but at some point, his followers went into the tomb. And, you know, they had a custom in that day of wrapping bodies in a certain way with linen before burying them. They would wrap the body and they would wrap the head as a separate thing and they would lay it in there. Well, guess what? The clothes were right where they had been left, but there was nobody in them. And, you know, you, you can still see, you can imagine what was going through their minds as they're listening to this. What in the world is that about? And so he continues on with the stories of the people who met him that day. Mary met him. Peter met him. And then he... he, he appears to the uh, those two that were going on the way to on the road to Emmaus was it it was just a few miles from Jerusalem and they were walking there sadly talking about all of this and suddenly Jesus joins them what are you talking about and gets in on the conversation and and begins to explain what really happened and they invite him in and Jewish custom you know a stranger at the end of the day they they invite him in for a meal and and probably had lodging in mind and and all of a sudden, they, they get ready to eat, and he breaks the bread, and he blesses it. And suddenly, suddenly, they knew who it was. And at that moment, he disappeared out of their sight. And, and they ran all the way back to Jerusalem, several miles, and told the disciples, we've seen the Lord, he's risen. And then while they were doing there, they're in a locked room. You would be, too, if you were in that circumstance. You, you'd be uh, saying, hey, you know, I'd, at least I want a lock between me and the, the danger out there. And all of a sudden, Jesus didn't pay a bit of attention to their lock. He just suddenly appeared right in the middle of the room. He asked for a piece of fish, and he ate it. And can you, can you imagine hearing this for the first time? What this man must have been hearing and understanding that not only did he come to take our sins upon him, he came to conquer death itself. And he rose from that tomb. And that was the glory of the message. And that's why you put your faith in him, because God sent him to rescue people from their sins. He is all of our message. He is all of our hope today. He is the one in whom I trust completely. My life is in his hands. 
He took my sins on that day. Oh, praise God. You know, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you obviously can't just believe in him and yourself. You can't say, well, I'm basically a good person. But I, you know, I need some help in these areas, so I'm going to believe in him too. No. Believing in him is stopping believing in yourself. It's coming to a realization you're not a good person. None of us are. Not by God's standard. But you know, it's okay to come to the place where we realize and are honest with what we are. I think a lot of people are afraid, afraid of that. Like there's no more hope if I just really am honest. I, I've got to pretend. I've got to try to be. A... No. In the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can be exactly what we are. Sinners in need of a Savior. Because the gospel message is not one that points a finger and condemns you. It's one that reaches out and says, let me take your burden. Let me take your guilt. Let me take your sin upon myself. Let me give you life. Put your faith in me. I have the power. I have the commission. This is the promise of God. This is the gospel in a nutshell. Put your faith in Jesus. It's not in me. It's not in my words even. It's in him. Put your faith in him and you'll be saved. You know, I understand that there's a progression of, of salvation. And I think that's something believers need to understand, that there is a progress. You know, we don't just jump right to full maturity just by being born any more than a baby when it's born is, you know, ready for adult life. But at the same time, there is a point when people pass from death to life. I can't explain it. When Jesus talked to, to Nicodemus about being born again, he said it's like the wind that comes through and you, you hear the sound, you, you, you know it's there, you, see, you may see the effects, but you don't really understand it. But it's not like that when people are born again of God's Spirit. There's a point in time when people pass from death to life, when their, their faith is just put in Him. I cannot engineer that, but I can tell you God's promise. If you will, if there is anybody who feels their need, it's not complicated. You come to him. I mean, think about what his, what his name even means. He calls him the Lord Jesus. Lord. For it, it starts with Lord. I mean, he is Lord. The message of the gospel, think about what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. It was the one you crucified. He's Lord. He is Lord. He is over all everything. He's over every devil. God's put everything in his hands. Well, if God's put everything in his hands, then you know, our relationship to him is kind of important. If we remain in the category of somebody who, re who resists and rebels and says, no, I don't want you. I will not submit to you. I'm going my own way. That's not a good thing. There's not going to be a good end to that. So the gospel begins with proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord. But for him to be Lord in a saving relationship, it means he's our Lord. It means our life is given to him. Now you think about uh, pottery, for example. Let's just take someone who is, is very, very gifted at making very beautiful pottery and it sells for a high price. What does the clay have to do to become that beautiful piece of pottery? It submits, doesn't it? I mean, it, it yields. There's going to be some manipulating. There's going to be the hands of, of a skilled craftsman are going to be placed upon that clay in very uh, key times. The, the shape of that thing is going to get changed. It might say, no, I, don't want, I want to be this way. And it says, no, this is, what, this is the way. I've got to smooth this rough area out. I've got to put a groove here. I've got to put, you know. The potter is the one who makes the determination. And I'll tell you, when we truly come to God, that's what our life is about. It's given to him. He has the power to make us what we need to be for eternity. It's not just about this life. My God, this is short. But a Savior who has the power, if he is truly Lord, 
to do whatever is needed. And of course, Jesus means Savior, doesn't it? Redeemer, rescuer. And it's the name God gave to his son. And he gave it to him because he will save his people from their sins. That's a pretty positive statement. He will save. He is able, we're told in Hebrews, to save completely those that come to God by him. Because he ever lives to pray. Praise God. You know, there's a part of me that just wants to explain it better, but that's not what it matters. That night, I don't think it was Paul's great explanations that were the issue. In fact, if that were the issue, he would have recorded that, wouldn't he? It was just the simplicity of lifting up a person who is Lord, who is Savior. Put your faith in him. And there was a moment in time when they said, yes. And they didn't say it superficially. They said, yes, from their very hearts and their beings. It was a turning point. It was going through a door never to return. It was going over a bridge and burning that bridge and say, from this moment on, I belong to Jesus Christ. I see my need of him, but I believe in him. Praise God. You know, many of you, many of you can remember Brother Thomas himself giving his testimony, uh, and others have heard it referred to. He was a pretty rough-cut guy, wasn't he? By all accounts, he grew up very, very hard. Broken home, bounced from pillar to post, unwanted in most cases, much of the time. Suffered in a TB sanitarium for a year or two in a terrible accident that left him in, that had him in excruciating pain, almost took his life. A, uh, just here and there, hard working, kind of a guy who would go out, at, go out at night and drink with his friends and get into fights and th call it a good time. But all that while, there was something kind of percolating in the back of his mind and his heart. He knew there was a God. He knew he needed to be right with that God. He knew he wasn't. God had, be, God had just begun something there that was just kind of simmering in the background. And of course, he had to make a living, and one way they did it back then was, was selling illegal whiskey, so he was a moonshiner. But you remember the story of how he went to that particular church, happened to be a Baptist church, and they had, they had some of the ways, traditional ways that evangelists worked. They'd the evangelist preached the gospel, but then he gave a trick, inv trick invitation. Every, every head bowed. You have a need, raise your hand. All right, everybody ra raise their hand, stand up. Okay, everybody that stand up, come down to the front. You know, just, just manipulating people into trying to make decisions. But there were people there who, who knew God in spite of the ways things were done. Of course, Brother Thomas got up there, and he was a bit of a rascal. He's saying, look, I didn't come down here to join your church, and he was beginning to make a fuss, and so they said, well, we better, you know, he's <laughs> making a disturbance. We better get him off to the side and talk to him out back. So they went to the office and talked with him a while. And you remember what the pastor, I think it was, asked him. He said, do you want to be saved? And Brother Thomas knew enough to say, yeah. But he said it in a way it was, do you want, I mean, uh, everybody wants to be saved. It was just kind of a general, sometime, some, some way, somehow kind of thing. And the pastor was wise enough to say, no, they don't. But he also asked the other question. Do you want to be saved now? And God used that simple word to bring him to a point where he said, yes. It wasn't just the words of the pastor. It was the words of God to his heart. What, do you, what will you do? And that's what salvation comes down to. It's God confronting your heart in whatever matter is necessary. It doesn't mean he comes in with a fist. It doesn't, sometimes it's the most gentle thing. Some people's salvation is a very cataclysmic, you know, just a tremendous experience, and other people's just almost imperceptible. 
But I'll tell you, there's a point in time when God confronts a heart and says, what about you? What about now? What will you do? And it's that point when people need to say yes. There's a lot of people out there that think you can just kind of take them down the Romans road and, and get them to say the right words and, and like they have the power to make the decision anytime. That's not so. Nobody can come unless the Lord draws. It's when he convicts the heart, you need me. And I have the power to, to cleanse you and make you, my, make you God's child. Will you surrender? Will you put your faith in me? That's when it matters. So many people in this world are just resist at that point and pull back. But I pray, I'll tell you, you can be saved right now if God's talking to your heart. You can say yes from the depths of your soul and he will wrap his arms of love around you and you will be his. He can give you his peace. He can let you know that you're real, that you're right with him, that you're ready. Should you die today, you would be ready to stand before him, that you're his. I just leave it with you. I don't know. My words, as I say, have no power, but his do. What a simple gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And the question is, what, where do you stand with respect to this? Has God saved you? Have you really cast your lot completely with him? Or are you still standing outside the door? I'm going to leave it between you and God. But if he's knocking on your heart's door, you say yes. There's a lot of people here that would join and say, say yes. I've been where you're at. I've been standing out the door. I know what a battle it can be, but the Lord brought me to a place where I knew he loved me, and I said, yes, and I'm not sorry. Oh, praise God. It's a challenging road through life, but he walks, you, he walks through every step of it with you. And what a hope he has laid before us. Oh, what a hope the gospel is. It doesn't depend upon my righteousness or anything. It depends on him and his grace to take me there. What a hope we have. Is that hope yours this morning? Praise God. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time. And may God richly bless you until then.